All right, we want to start off in dealing with the whole issue of insomnia. And uh, then later on in the second hour, we're going to be dealing with the issue of chronic fatigue. What is this issue of insomnia? One third of our lives on an average is spent sleeping. That's a significant piece of data. So much of your life is spent sleeping. That's encouraging. You realize that a lot of time goes by and you are sound asleep when it does. Um, quality of sleep is a critical issue for many people. It's not just how much time is spent in bed, but whether or not you are experiencing high quality sleep. Now, sleep is just as important as balanced nutrition and exercise and maintaining good health as well. In fact, when a person doesn't get enough sleep, it has a hallucinogenic effect upon their life. Uh, back just a few years ago, there was a guy who tried to set the Guinness Book of World Records by going, uh, he, was a, he was a radio disc jockey and he was going to do uh, two or three days of continuous broadcasting without getting any sleep. With all that ex ex um, um, energy that's expounded, in terms of broadcasting and not getting any sleep, by the third or fourth day, he was climbing the walls and he was uh, seeing things that weren't there. Uh, there is a sense in which lack of sleep produces, this is the way God has created us, in us certain, uh, causes a certain mechanism where now reality is completely distorted, chemicals are released in the brain, that are not normal when we've had the proper kind of sleep um, or there's a deficit of certain chemicals in the brain as well and we begin to imagine things that aren't there and we begin to see things that aren't there um, and this particular disc jockey saw large bugs crawling up the wall and um, um, so as a result of it they had to go in and drag him out of the control room the broadcast control room uh, having gone completely nuts. And that was all as a result of sleep. Sleep has this hallucinogenic effect upon people just the way hallucinogenic drugs do or lack of sleep um, has that effect. So if you're not getting good sleep, it will have an effect upon your health and ability to think and your ability to concentrate as well. Your capacity to be able to stay focused on a particular task or a particular problem will be greatly affected if you're not getting the proper kind of sleep that you need to get. It's interesting what has happened, what has been attributed to uh, a lack of proper sleep. Uh, these disasters occurred in the wee hours of the night. Some of you probably remember the meltdown at Three Mile Island uh, in New York State. That happened in the wee hours of the night in the morning. And there are some who attribute it to the fact that there was um, sleep cause uh, effect in, in many of the workers that were supposed to oversee the site at that time. Um, some of you don't realize, but the Exxon Valdez oil spill on Bly Reef in Alaska occurred in the wee hours of the night. And there are so many who believe that that's attributed to the fact that the people on duty, uh, whether it was the captain or whoever it was on, that was on duty of the ship, had actually were so sleep deprived that they made terrible judgments. Um, or Chernobyl, the nuclear power plant in Russia. It was during the wee hours of the night that uh, that disaster occurred as well. So, um, or at least the beginning of what occurred, what eventually became a disaster. So all of that was a result of sleep. Now, those are kind of macro effects of lack of sleep. You can only imagine what, what's going to happen on the micro effects of individual people in their lives when they don't have enough sleep. How it affects, I mean, you as a student, your studies, your ability to concentrate, your ability to read, your ability to write when you haven't had the proper kind of sleep. Um, most adults need about eight hours per night of sleep on an average. Now, that doesn't fit everybody perfectly, but if we were to take a look at most studies on this, seem to confirm that about, oh, less than probably 1% to 2% of adults only need three hours of sleep a night. And those are the type of people that are usually 
real extreme geniuses. Einstein only needed a couple hours of sleep every night. That's all he needed. Extreme geniuses tend to be the type of people that only need that amount of sleep at night. Um, some people need four hours of sleep, which would be oh, probably about 2 or 3 percent of the population. There are others who, who uh, need about four or five hours of sleep. That would be about 4 percent of the population. Six hours of sleep then suddenly jumps up to 10 percent of the population. Seven hours of sleep jumps way up to 30 percent of the population. Eight hours of sleep, 45 percent of the population. Eight hours of sleep. Yes? Taking a survey, or do they? Yeah, obviously they have a representative group, probably about a thousand. That's a kind of a standard norm group, and they survey. They keep strict standards on when they go to bed, when they fall asleep, how long they're asleep. They have to record all this, and um, and stuff like that. yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, how they're reacting to life. Um, nine hours of sleep a night, uh, about six percent of the population. And 10 hours of sleep a night, again, probably about 2 or 3 percent of the population. So that gives you a little bit of an idea on, on who needs what. Um, but your average person, average normally functioning person, between 7 and 8 hours of sleep a night is the vast majority of people, by far. And if you're not getting that, somehow you're probably depriving yourself of some kind of sleep. So that's critical. So let's talk about the issue of insomnia in relationship to sleep. Insomnia, not being able to sleep. I want to make some observation. Insomnia is a subjective experience because it describes a variety of different experiences that people have um, in relationship to their sleep and their patterns. So Somewhat, it's kind of hard to define insomnia. Uh, it can involve difficulty falling to sleep or staying asleep or enjoying a restful night's sleep. It can involve that. Um, it's usually considered a symptom that may be caused by many factors. Um, like, for instance, where you live in the world. Uh, if you live in Alaska, where um, the sun shines six months of the year, most of the day, and then it's dark six months of the year, most of the day. Then the, during the times of light, you're probably awake an awful lot, and it's hard to go to sleep. During the times of darkness, you tend to sleep a lot longer and a lot more um, if you're way up north. So it could be factors like that. Sleep deprivation is associated with bizarre behavior. As I said, a lack of sleep can have an hallucinogenic effect upon people. Um, after three to five days of sleep deprivation, chemicals similar to LSD start to appear in the blood. And so that's the kind of thing that produces those hallucinogenic effects. They begin to see things that aren't there or imagine or hear things that aren't there. And they begin to think that they're schizophrenic. Um, causes, it causes memory failure and impairs normal mental acuity. It limits attention span. It also, hallucinations are common, perhaps brought on by the LSD-like substances. After sleep deprivation, 10 days may be required for all body functions to return to normal. Once you've deprived yourself for a long period of time, it would take about 10 days of very faithful seven to eight hours of sleep at night in order to return to a normal functioning lifestyle again. There's a link between sleep and maintenance of the immune system. We, we know that for sure. The immune system, when you're not getting the proper kind of sleep or enough sleep, tends to be compromised and you tend to be more susceptible to physical problems, viruses, uh, bacteria, um, general, just general diseases that come along because your immune system is so depressed. Sleep changes over a person's lifetime. 
Usually, uh, when a person is younger, they tend to need more sleep and require more sleep. As they tend to get older, they require less and less sleep. When you get to be retirement age, you don't sleep as long or as well. Uh, you tend to get er tired earlier in the evening, but then you wake up several times in the middle of the night as you get older. Um, boy, that's come to me because this past week I found out I'm going to be a grandfather. Now, I know that most of you thought I was around 25 years of age, but, but um, you now I'm going to be a grandfather. So I'm getting older, all right? And I realize that I'm getting older. So you don't sleep as well as you did when you were young. I can remember when I was in college, I could sleep through, I mean, you could have World War III going on in the room. They could be playing music, have lights on, sleep right through it. Now, just like Ecclesiastes 12 talks about, I awake at the least little sound. You know, whoop, I'm wide awake, right? Which tells me that I'm not really sleeping really, really deep. There are several true organic problems may contribute to insomnia as well. Sometimes certain kinds of diseases do have an effect upon a person's capacity to be able to sleep. Insomnia is influenced by age and gender. In 1995, 49% of adults questions had difficulty sleeping an average of at least five nights per month. This equates to 87 million people with problems sleeping. Stress and worry are some of the greatest reasons that are given. 31% admitted to dozing off during, while driving a vehicle. 12% of those who did were involved in an accident. 37%. Wow. That almost is scary driving the LA freeways. You think of 37% or 31% of all those out there have the potential to fall asleep. Um, no wonder there are accidents the way we have them. Well, what are some of the costs that are related to insomnia? Well, in 1990, direct costs of medical care or self-treatment includes costs borne by parents, organized health care providers, insurance companies, or the government were estimated at $10.9 billion. By 1993, costs had risen to $15.4 billion. 1994, the indirect costs, such as uh, decreased productivity at work, health care needs, uh, property costs related to accidents and medical costs associated with the comorbid conditions were estimated to be between 70 mil billion and 92 billion annually. Wow, that's pretty serious, pretty serious cost. Now, it could be questioned how those numbers were really arrived at, but I would imagine that everybody putting those numbers together would say that these are estimates. But they do take it, it does take a toll financially. So let's define what are we talking about as best as we can. Well, a pro precise definition is difficult because the amount of sleep needed by each individual to function at peak performance varies. Some sud studies suggest no newborns require 16 to 18 hours, children uh, to the age of 10, 9 to 10 hours, uh, age 10 to adult, uh, 7.5 to 8 hours. Elderly, 6.5 hours. Um, but too many make exceptions to this hard, these, these hard and fast rules. There are many who do make a lot of exceptions. Um, what are solutions for insomnia? Well, many, uh, many people obviously turn to medications. Um, uh, sleeping pills. Uh, whether they're over-the-counter sleeping pills or prescription type of sleeping pills. There are many who do that. Um, uh, some turn to sleep hygiene, um, where you set a regular time to go to bed and wake up. You try to normalize your routine as much as possible. Even if you're staying in an unfamiliar place, you try to eat dinner at the same time you normally would. You don't go to bed early. You get up and out of bed at a regular time, even if sleep was very poor. So you make certain that the sleeping room is quiet, darkened, and cool. And then a person tends to do better in terms of their sleep. All of that is just what is commonly referred to as common sense or hygiene. Uh, but it's amazing how many people don't practice good 
wisdom or hygiene when it comes to the, these kind of issues and in terms of sleep. Exercise uh, regularly early in the day or preferably in the late afternoon, but not in the evening. Avoid uh, within three hours of bedtime because that produces certain chemicals in your body when you exercise. And if you're doing it two to three hours um, before you go to bed, those chemicals will still be working on your body. So at least exercise three hours before you plan on going to bed and going to sleep. has a tendency for those chemicals to dissipate in your body and then your muscles are much more ready to relax. You're too tensed up. Avoid afternoon or evening napping. When you're having difficulty uh, sleeping at night, you need to uh, consolidate your sleep time. Avoid confrontations with others just before bedtime. Avoid frustrating activities such as balancing the checkbook just before you go to bed. That's a very frustrating responsibility, especially in seminary. All right. Avoid spicy or heavy foods during the evening as well. And of course, do not eat meals, small snacks, to alleviate hunger is okay, or drink large quantities of liquids late at night, especially caffeine-related uh, or caffeine-related uh, liquids. Um, coffee, uh, sodas with caffeine in them, well, that'll set you, that'll have a tendency to work on your system, and you won't sleep as well at night either. Don't read, work, eat, or watch TV in bed. The bed should only be for sleep-related purposes. Don't do that. All right? Don't read work because you have a tendency, then your body tends to equate that with some kind of stimulation. So when you lay down, it's not equated with, this is a time to go to sleep. We are creatures of habit. That's the way God created us. And sometimes when we get ourselves into bad habits and our body is used to a certain bad practice, then it's very, very difficult to get out of that bad pra practice. All right. Um, <clears throat> if sleep doesn't begin within a short time, that is 20 to 30 minutes, leave the bed and don't return until sleepy. Some say the opposite. Continue to lie in bed with your eyes closed. But the general rule of thumb is get up, get out of bed, you're not sleepy enough, and then get sleepy. Maybe go do something, read, whatever it is that's going to help you to be sleepy, and, and then go back to bed, and you'll be ready to fall asleep hopefully within 20 or 30 minutes of laying down. Sleep only as much as needed to feel refreshed and alert upon arriving, arising. Avoid oversleeping. Avoid or minimize caffeine, as we talked about before. Coffee, tea, soft drinks, um, alcohol and tobacco, especially near, near bedtime. More specifically, avoid caffeine for at least six hours before bedtime. Also, some medications like Sudafed, which have the same kind of effect or caffeine effect um, as some of those sodas. So when you feel fatigued early in the morning or in the afternoon, take a brisk walk outdoors. This will help you readjust your body clock so that uh, circadian patterns in terms of being awake and asleep and in relationship also as well to the temperature of your body, which goes down uh, during the peak times of the night, you want to make sure those patterns are into a routine. All right, if we were to take a look at the stages of sleep, they would look like this. Some studies, this is uh, an electroencephalograph, or EEG, which... Um, uses electrodes placed there on the scalp to record and amplify uh, electrical activity in the brain. Um, when a person is awake, you can see the EEG pattern here. It looks something like this. This is kind of consciousness. And this is what's happening, at least what the EEG is able to record in terms of brain activity. Um, so we are able to identify certain stages of sleep based upon those EEG patterns. Um, there's pre-sleep, and then there's hypnagogic state, which is about 10 to 15 minutes. Then there's the state that occurs as a person is just falling to sleep. And then it's at that particular time, that's a time, for some reason, for immense mental creativity. Just as you're falling asleep. Maybe you've had that 
um, where you've been writing a paper or you've been trying to solve a problem during the day and just as you were falling asleep, you thought of the answer to it. Oh, I know what it is. I know what I need to do. And you have to get yourself out of bed and you have to write it down in order to get that thing done. Well, that's, that's very common among a lot of people that just before you fall asleep, for some reason your brain is immensely creative. Um, a person... Uh, puts pieces together which one may not otherwise have constructed during this particular time. And so you're putting relationships together that you didn't do before in your normal conscious waking time. Um, so, in identifying some of these stages, um, stage one would be something like this. The alpha waves are very, very prominent in stage one of sleep. And you can see this. This is quite a bit different than what we saw in terms of the consciousness and being awake. The alpha waves are very, very prominent. A person is easily awakened during this first stage of sleep. Very easy to do that. Stage two, then there are irregular, larger wave patterns which are much more prominent. In fact, you can see this. The EEG shows them up. And, and in fact, there's a, a sporadic... Uh, boost in these wave patterns um, and these are what we call sleep spindles all right when they this is a stage two where you're falling asleep and this person is much harder to awaken at stage two you try to wake this person and they're they do not want to wake up all right uh, this is usually the stage that's going on at that time sleep spindles may occur which and sudden muscle contractions some of you probably remember that. As you're falling asleep, all of a sudden, you'll jerk. Or you've seen somebody do that. And they think that there is a relationship between these spiked energy things that are going on in the, in the brain and these sleep spindles and your muscle movements. All right? So there's sudden jerking that occurs that is involuntary. Yes? Yeah. Yeah, probably so. You've seen somebody that's laying down or laying on a desk like that, and you see them jerk, then they're falling into stage two of sleep. So that that happens during that particular stage. Well, then stage three is where the delta waves become prominent, large, slow, uh, one over five, two over five cycles per minute. Um, now, this is a radically different changed looking EEG. And you can see these delta waves. These are just dipping way low in terms of stage three of sleep. Deep sleep occurs at this particular stage. Once you're reached stage three, it's as if your brain is relaxed and you start to really sleep. Stage four then, very, very large delta waves. You can see them now, they're extended, and um, this is very deep sleep is experienced. Sleepwalking and talking can occur, and the person won't remember it the next day, all right? They'll, they'll get up. I don't know, do we have any sleepwalkers that's willing to admit it in here, in our class? Nobody's willing to admit it, okay? That's okay, you don't have to. It doesn't have to be confession time here. But uh, we had a gal in our congregation where she was, uh, had a terrible problem with sleepwalking. And in fact, her parents had to um, put uh, little bells and stuff on her door, which would wake them up in the middle of the night when she'd open her door and leave, or bells on her window because she'd crawl out her window. One day, they found her. She was in her uh, pajamas. She had walked all the way down the street and was sitting at a public park bench in the middle of the night. And mom and dad would sound asleep when it happened. And the next day, the girl had no recollection of what had happened, even though she was able to kind of, in a groggy fashion, interact with her mom and dad. They basically took her back home, put her to sleep, and you know, bolted the door so that she couldn't get out the door in the middle of the night. Um, so it's this stage four of sleep that that occurs. And this is also the stage where nightmares and terrors may occur. Um, now, what's happening when 
when the brain goes through all this. Well, God has designed us in such a way that when the brain goes through all that activity, it's as if your brain is purging a lot of the sensory data it has taken in all day. You have a lot of data coming in that is, uh, in a sense, meaningless data to you. Um, temperature is data coming to your brain. Um, smells are data coming to your brain. Eyesight, you notice things even though you don't concentrate. You don't notice an awful lot of things. Daylight activities, things, people going by, stuff like this. Is data going in, data going in. Things you hear. If you listen very carefully, you can see, hear something running in the background. Or you can hear our data projector and a little fan running there. Well, your brain's registering all that data, even though you, you choose not to focus on it. And it's at sleep at night that it's almost as if God has designed it in such a way that all that's purged. So the next day, you'll feel refreshed. There's a significant change that occurs. So those are the four stages of sleep. Now, it's interesting. It's during rapid eye movement sleep, or what they call REM sleep, that sawtooth-looking EEG patterns begin to emerge. A person's eyelids begin to flutter. If you ever watch somebody sleep, their eyelids begin to flutter. And this is where they're in rapid eye movement sleep. Um, REM normally follows a 90-minute minute pattern. Uh, five dream periods occur during a typical eight-hour night. So stage one, two, three, and four. There's this pattern of five minutes, then 10 minutes, then 20 minutes, then 30 minutes, then 40 minutes, REM, REM, REM at the end of each one of those or until wakened. Now, if a person, studies have been done on this, if a person is um, awakened just before these five minute, 10 minute, 20 minute, 30 minute patterns, then they will mentally go crazy if they're not allowed to have REM. They, there, there are chemical processes that occur in the brain that causes a person to lose uh, track of reality. Just like the hallucinating, hallucinogenic effects, the LSD type chemicals that are released in the brain. But here you are sleeping, you're going through the other stages, but you're not getting REM sleep. So that shows you just how important that REM sleep is um, overall. And if you were to look at a typical night of sleep, you can see this here. A person is awake and they fall to stage one sleep, stage two sleep, stage three, stage four. And then within the first hour and a half, they start coming out of it real quickly. And they experience, they come clear back up to REM and they experience five minutes of REM. Then they go right back into stage, uh, from stage one to stage two, three, four, a little bit, um, about the same amount of time, an hour to an hour and a half. Then they start coming out of it. And uh, now they got 10 minutes REM, 10 minutes. Then back down stage two, it's stage three. They don't go clear down now. And they come back out of it. And now they got 20 minutes REM that occurs. And then down to stage one. Then they have 30 minutes REM. Back stage one or until wakened, uh, hence the 30 minutes. So in an average eight-hour evening of sleep, you experience stage one, two, three, four, and then REM for five minutes. Stage one, two, three, four again, REM for 10 minutes. Stage one, two, and three, REM for 20 minutes. Stage one and two, REM for 30 minutes. Stage one and two again, REM for 40 minutes. And that seems to be the pattern that goes all the way through a normal, we're talking about a normal eight hour pattern of sleep. If we're to understand the process of what goes on, Aaron? So someone with, that only needs six hours of sleep then, do they compact this or do they just not get, get as many REM cycles? They don't get as many REM cycles usually. Um, no, it usually stays at a pretty consistent pattern with people. So, which are really critical. Now you can see, if we were to lay these EEG patterns side by side, down the left hand side of this chart, this is awake, stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four, and REM sleep. You can see the contrast here. Um, this is awake, and one, and two, 
And you can see these sleep spindles here that occur at two. Um, stage three, then the delta patterns, three and four, the delta patterns are really big. Big, big, big delta patterns. Then REM for five minutes, and then 10 minutes, then 20 minutes, then 30, and then 40, it looks like this. It gives you a pretty good idea of how this works. If we were to take a look at this, a chart kind of more spread out, down here across the bottom, one hour, two hour, three hour, four hour, five, all the way out to eight hours of sleep, there seems to be the pattern. This is the person that's awake, and then they go through all four stages. They're up to five minutes REM, down three or all four stages, back up to 10 minutes REM, down two stages, then up to um, uh, REM, up to one, and then, or stage two, and then REM uh, for uh, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, and then 40 minutes, all the way out. That gives you a little bit of an idea of how those sleep disorders, um, or I mean how a normal night's sleep, I should say, should go. So what are we talking about? If we were to take a look at this from a biblical perspective, God has given us in our day and age today, a wonderful capacity with the technology that we have to understand some of the physiology of, speed, uh, of sleep. Um, but the key thing for us is going to be looking at this from a biblical perspective. Now, there are illustrations of insomnia. For example, if you take your Bible, let's go back to Esther. Esther chapter 6 and verse 1. During that night, the king could not sleep so that he gave order to bring the book of records, the chronicles, and they were read before the king. So here, uh, the king is unable to sleep. He was experiencing insomnia. If we go to Daniel chapter 2, we can see the same thing true here in the book of Daniel. In chapter 2 and verse 1. Now in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 1 says, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams and his spirit was troubled and his sleep left him. Here's another example of insomnia. An illustration of insomnia. Now what then are ingredients for a restful night's sleep? By the way, in both of those cases, both in Esther and Daniel, one of the things that contributed to their sleeplessness was the sins own, I mean, was the king's own sins in relationship to making major decisions about uh, what God wanted him to do or didn't want him to do, which contributed to his restlessness. Well, one of the first things, Proverbs chapter 3, verses 13 through 26. Um, deals with the whole concept of wisdom. Um, and verse 13 says, How blessed is the man who finds wisdom, and the man who gains understanding, for its profit is better than the profit of silver, and its gain than fine gold. She is more precious than jewels, and nothing you desire compares with her. Long life is in her right hand, and her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are pleasant ways, and all of her paths are our peace. She is like a tree of life to those who take hold of her, and happy are all who hold fast to her. By the, uh, the Lord, by wisdom, founded the earth. By understanding, he established the heavens. By his knowledge, the deeps were broken up, and the skies dripped with dew. My son, let them not depart from your sight. Keep sound wisdom and discretion, so that they will be life to your soul and adornment to your neck. They will walk in your way securely. Then you will walk in your way securely. And your foot will not stumble. When you lie down, you will not be afraid. When you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. Do not be afraid of sudden fear, nor of the onslaught of the wicked when it comes. For the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from being caught. So you get this idea. A person who pays attention to wisdom, who acts wisely in life, then their sleep is sweet. That's a good way to look at sleep. Who is wise in the general affairs of life. Who uses biblical wisdom. Who's committed to biblical morality. Then their, their sleep is sweet. They're not plagued by guilt. 
They're not plagued by irresponsibility. They're not plagued by laziness or being a sluggard. And hence, they have to worry about uh, poverty coming on them. They're not plagued by any of that. Um, they have sweet sleep. So seeing all of life from God's point of view is what a truly wise person is. Thinking God's thoughts after him. Verse 24 says we don't have to have fear at night. Verse 26 says our confidence is in God. So a change in thinking affects every area of our life. Philippians 4.8, we have to saturate our mind with Scripture. The things that are true, honest, just, worthy, excellent, praiseworthy. We're supposed to dwell and set our mind down on those things. Uh, a truly wise person does that. So that's part of the ingredients of a, a sweet sleep. Fear of God, Proverbs 19, 23. Here, in the sense, a God consciousness. Uh, verse 23 says, The fear of the Lord leads to life so that one may sleep satisfied, untouched by evil. So acknowledge in his perfect sovereignty and his perfect goodness and awe and a respect for him that produces the attitude of worship as a habit of life. You're at peace with God, as Proverbs 3 has already talked about. You're at peace because you're following his wisdom. This includes trusting God. When you truly understand who he is and are thus provoked to worship him as a lifestyle, you grow in your trust of him. Then there is obedience and holiness. Now back in Proverbs chapter 6, verses 20 through 23. Verse 20 says, My son, observe the commandments of your father. Do not forsake the teaching of your mother. Bind them continually on your heart. Tie them around your neck. When you walk about, they will guide you. When you sleep, they will watch over you. And when you awake, they will talk to you. For the commandment is a lamp, and the teaching a light, and reproof for disciplines are the way of life. That has to do with holiness. So, when you don't do that, when you disobey, when you're unholy, then there's a corresponding guilt that you cover, uh, carry, and that guilt will plague your sleep. Contentment is another issue. Ecclesiastes chapter 5 and verse 12. Ecclesiastes, here Solomon is dealing in this autobiographical uh, polemic. In verse 12, he says, The sleep of the working man is pleasant whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich man does not allow him to sleep. In other words, you work hard, you do all the duties you're supposed to do that day, then you'll sleep better at night. The person who doesn't get, uh, who, who concentrates only on, on um, satisfying their own appetite, then doesn't end up sleeping very well. Um, that's a very self-centered part of life. Um, a good illustration of that, as you can see with the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 and following, where Paul talks about his own life being at peace. But he says, But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am in. I know how to get along with humble means. I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who give, strengthens me. So, there's a good illustration of that. He understood the concept of contentment, and Paul slept well at night. Or we go back to Psalm chapter 4 and verse 8, and here David... Uh, deals with the whole issue of his own contentment with God, which set his mind at rest. In peace, he says, I will both lie down and sleep, for thou alone, O Lord, dost make me to dwell in safety. Which, by the way, is a wonderful verse to get someone who's struggling with insomnia to memorize. Psalm 4, 8. It's a great one. In peace, I will both lie down and sleep, for thou alone, O Lord, dost make me to dwell in safety. But what do you do if I just can't get to sleep? Or if I wake up in the middle of the night and I can't get back to sleep? 
Well, I've got to see the inability to sleep in light of the sovereignty of God. That's vitally important. Believe that these times represents opportunities from God. There's an opportunity for examination. Is it because of guilt? Is it because of sin in my life? Maybe it's a lack of trust in God or a lack of a biblical mindset that's really oriented towards wisdom. Is that the reason? Or, as the psalmist says in Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24. Let's go over there real quickly and take a look at that. Verses 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts and see if there be any hurtful way in me and lead me in the everlasting way. So the psalmist here, David says, uh, search me. I want you to know me. Uh, sleeplessness, uh, his anxiousness was an occasion for him to have God do some evaluations of his life. Is he doing the right thing? It's an opportunity for medit meditation as well. Um, as Psalm 119, verse 148 um, talks about, uh, My eyes anticipate the night watches that I may meditate on thy word. Or Psalm chapter 16 and verse 7. Psalm 16 and verse 7 has to do with meditation as well. Um, Uh, I will bless the Lord who has counseled me. Indeed, my mind instructs me in the night. So he meditates on the things of the Lord in the night. And then there's Psalm 77 and verse 6. Psalm 77 and verse 6. Where um, this is a psalm of Asaph. Verse 6, I will remember my song in the night. I will meditate with my heart. And my spirit ponders. Or there's Psalms 77 verses 11 and 12. I shall remember the deeds of the Lord. Surely I will remember thy wonders of old. I will meditate on all thy works. All thy work. And amuse on thy deeds. Or going back to Psalm 4.4. Where the psalmist. Here it says Tremble. And do not sin. Meditate in your heart upon your bed and be still, still. Selah. So it's an opportunity for meditation. It's also an opportunity for communication. Um, Psalm 4.1. It's an opportunity ultimately to pray to God. Uh, when we're experiencing sleeplessness in the middle of the night. This is a great opportunity to use the time wisely. Answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. Thou hast relieved me in my distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. Or Psalm 77 again. Back to what Asaph has to say. Verses 1 and 2. Uh, he says, My voice rises to God, and I will cry aloud. My voice rises to God, and he will hear me. In the day of trouble, I sought the Lord. In the night, my hand was stretched out without weariness. Or, of course, we could jump to the New Testament. And there the Apostle Paul again in Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, which really has to do with anxiousness and worry. Um, where he says in verse 6, he says, Be anxious for nothing but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, shall guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So, prayer for your own burdens is an opportunity for that. And prayer for others and their burdens. Kind of gets your focus off of self. That's critical. That's the thing that tends to keep us up and tends to keep us worrying. Yes? Doing these outside of bed, I mean, getting up and out of bed, like we had said before, or can they? Would you say just lie in bed and do this? What you? No, I think it's not wrong to lie in bed and do this, but um, you'll tend to get sleepier if you get up and you and you do it, and then you come back when you're real sleepy. And 20 to 30 minutes, then that rule. 
applies yeah. to these as well? Yeah. Okay. You should be going to sleep once you lay down within 20 to 30 minutes. That should be a rule of thumb. But the other one was 20 to 30 minutes away from bed, correct? Or was that just no. until you're tired? No, that's just until you're oh. tired. Okay. No. You're only away from bed until you're tired. Not, and there's no set limit on that. All right. We summarize it like this. Address the possible spiritual causes of insomnia. What would they be? Well, lifestyle of habitual worry and anxiety and not trusting God. That can cause insomnia. You've got to find that out as a good counselor. Or maybe there's guilt over disobedience that has been not dealt with in a proper way from a biblical perspective. They haven't confessed it to God or to others. Or they, and they haven't sought, they haven't repented before him uh, and sought his forgiveness or the forgiveness of others. Or there's a lack of hard work during all you know to do uh, and can do to solve the issues, but doing more, no more than that. So there's a lack of hard work in the person's life. We're not having a biblical mindset, a mind that's so saturated with Scripture that they, they think biblically as a lifestyle. Their tendency is naturally to think worrisome, pessimistic, God-dishonoring, negative thoughts rather than hopeful thoughts, thoughts that rest upon the promises of God, thoughts that trust in the atonement of Christ and his constant intercession as a high priest before God um, that are supposed to give hope and security. Uh, there's a lifetime, uh, a lifestyle of discontentment with people, with circumstances, and with God. And then when God keeps your eyelids open, they can see it as an opportunity for examination, meditation, and supplication before God. This becomes the key time and the key opportunity. All right, after we come back from break, we're going to deal with chronic fatigue syndrome. Yes, question. What about all the drugs that are out to help people sleep? What's the what's thoughts on that from your perspective? Um, most people, if they are practicing good, wise sleep hygiene, do not need the drugs. They are quick fixes. Most people don't need them. Now, I realize... There are some people who have legitimate diseases that cause insomnia and the drugs are a real asset. So I don't want to rule that out. But for your average person, it has to do with bad lifestyle. And they shouldn't have to take the drug. Um, and like we said, what we tried to stress here is the fact that if they've done everything they can and they still aren't sleeping well, then they have to see this as an opportunity to actually use this time actively to pray, to meditate uh, upon the Word of God, and to examine their own life. See what's going on. Uh, in order to wrap up the stuff that we talked about in regards to insomnia, I want to recommend an article for you. It's just an excellent one. In fact, it just recently came out in the Volume 4, Issue 1, Winter 2007, The Journal of Modern Ministry. And in the back of it, there's an article written about sleep disorders and biblical counseling by Charles Hodge, who is a uh, medical doctor, not the theologian. All right, the medical doctor. Um, uh, sleep disorders and biblical... And what he has written there is really, really good. It goes on through, through several pages of the issue of uh, sleep loss, the causes of sleep deprivation, scriptural teaching on wise use of resources, sleep and wise use of resources, uh, treatments for sleep loss, changing schedules, obesity treatments, practical sleep hygiene, uh, medications and insomnia. Um, and then he talks about, um, in one of the charts there, uh, medical diseases and disorders that are known to affect sleep. Um, this list is by no means exhaustive, but uh, uh, menopause will do it. Benign prostate uh, hypertrophic uh, trophy, I should say, obesity, bursitis, uh, obstructive sleep apnea, um, cancer, uh, peptic ulcer uh, disease, chronic pain, reflex uh, systematic uh, dystrophia, uh, uh, circadian rhythm disorder, REM behavior disorder, uh, cough, restless leg syn syndrome, fibromyalgia, a rheumatoid arthritis, gastroesophageal uh, 
reflex seizures and um, uh, seizures, I should say, and heart disease. Um, so that gives you just a little sampling of lists, and then he has the medications that are known to affect sleep. And there's, this is not an exhaustive list either, but he talks about the variety of different drugs and medications that affect sleep as well. That is just, it's a superb, very well-written article. It's the Journal of Modern Ministry. You may want to get a, it's worth it just to pull a copy from the library and run a, run a copy of this to put in your files. Uh, in, fact, in fact, the next time I teach this class, probably one of the things I'm going to do is I'm going to excerpt this article and actually try to see if I can reproduce it. But um, it's in Journal of Modern Ministry, Volume 4, Issue 1, Winter 2007. So um, you, you may want to pay attention to that. Well, let's see if we can turn our attention to chronic fatigue syndrome, a CFS, often referred to. And there, again, is a wonderful uh, section in, um, on CFS in the Christian Counselor's Medical Desk Reference written by Robert Smith. In fact, beginning on page 167, counseling those with chronic fatigue syndrome. And if you want a more exhaustive treatment of this from a medical doctor point of view, I recommend that you read this particular article. So um, we're going to kind of um, deal with uh, similar things that, he's, that he talks about in this particular article, somewhat from a different perspective than he does here, but it all ends up the same place and in a sense in the same way. He even talks about um, uh, Epstein-Barr, the virus, and um, how that is uh, a, 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 the most frequently used theory is that uh, chronic fatigue syndrome is caused by Epstein virus, uh, and the EBV virus. So, um, and there are some pamphlets and some physicians who actually endorse that. Now, what is chronic uh, fatigue syndrome? What are we talking about here? Well, according to Dr. Smith, he says, the title fairly well describes the condition, one of, the, one of being tired all the time for a long time. Yet for some reason this problem seems different f uh, from the complaint that plagues many busy people. How does CFS uh, differ from the fatigue of normal life? Um, and then he talks about even the medical literature is somewhat vague about that. Um, but uh, how, that, that is a critical question. How does uh, chronic fatigue syndrome differ from just normal fatigue? You're just flat out tired because you have been exhausting yourself for a long time. Well, let's make some observations about this. Number one, um, CFS is not fi fatal. It's not a fatal disease, never was. Number two, it's, this is a good thing, it's not progressive. It's not progressive. And what we mean by that is um, it doesn't seem to, to progress to, to higher or different stages. It usually, once it's acquired, seems to stay the same. Thirdly, there's no cure. And part of the reason that there is no cure is because it's very, very difficult to diagnose. <laughs> that makes it very, very difficult to diagnose. Um, some say up to 24% of the population actually is affected by CFS. Symptoms last about two and a half years and then return to normal after that. Two-thirds of the people that are affected by it are women, 15 to 34 years of age, uh, two to one over men. All right? Two to one over men. Um, that has caused some people to speculate, we're not sure, that somehow CFS is related to um, the menstrual cycles of a woman or of her growing older and her ability to reproduce and um, somehow there seems to be a link there uh, between the two but it's only an associational link or, or uh, a distance correspondence to it. No direct cause has ever been proven. Um, but the fact that two-thirds are women is certainly a significant uh, statement. Um, uh, some of the medical information on this, uh, there's no proven diagnostic or therapeutic approach exists to it um, at all. The main focus is on alleviating symptoms through exercise, nutrition, and drugs, oftentimes Prozac, Xanax, 
or some kind of placebo seems to work. And the placebos, again, like we talked about in relationship to depression, here seem to work just as well as the Prozac and the Xanax in terms of treating CFS. At one time, it was thought it was caused by Epstein-Barr -Barr virus, but 90% of American adults have the, an antibody for this. So um, that wouldn't account for 24% of the population still having it if it was an EBV virus that was causing it. Um, there are other proposed causes of this as well, like environmental toxins um, and a, a lot of diseases that aren't diagnosed often it goes back to environmental causes and toxins and some have been proven to be true. Uh, this could be, that could be an issue. Other types of viruses that have yet to be diagnosed or identified. Uh, increase in stress um, is another issue. Uh, heredity um, could be an issue that it would run in families then. There have been no studies, to my knowledge, that have demonstrated that. Some have suggested it, but not demonstrated as a hard fact. Um, too much exercise. Um, there are some people that um, believe that uh, too much exercise is actually what brings on chronic fatigue syndrome. Or, and this is interesting, saliva. All right, that there is something in the chemical balance of the saliva that changes the condition of the body in relationship to chronic fatigue syndrome. Well, if we were to take a look at this, the criteria, uh, both are required here, major and minor criteria. Major criteria, new onset of persistent or relapsing debilitating fatigue or fatigability in a person who has no previous history of similar symptoms that does not um, resolve with bed rest and that is severe enough to reduce or impair average daily activity below 50% of the patient's pre-morbid activity level for a period of at least six months. So that would be part of the major criteria that would define CFS. Um, now, uh, exclusion of numerous other clinical conditions that cause that could produce similar symptoms include malignancy, uh, autoimmune disease, bacterial uh, fungal or parasitic disease, uh, localized infection, uh, disease related to immune deficiency virus, which is the HIV um, infection, uh, chronic inflammatory disease, neuromuscular disease, uh, endocrine diseases, uh, drug abuse, um, um, side effects of chronic medication or other toxic agent. So, <clears throat> so it, it's interesting. There could be a relationship between these, but um, um, a direct relationship has never been demonstrated from a medical or biological standpoint. Minor criteria would be this. Uh, to fulfill a symptom criteria, a symptom must have begun at or after the time of onset of increased uh, fatigability and uh, must have persisted or reoccurred over a period of at least six months. Individual symptoms may or may not have occurred simultaneously. At least eight of the following have to be met in this case. Symptom credibility would be this, like for instance, there have to be eight of these in order for it to be defined as chronic fatigue syndrome. Anytime I read this, every time I go over this, I think about the ADD and ADHD criteria. I mean, it's very, very similar where you've got to have a certain number of each one of the categories uh, that are listed there in order to be definitively diagnosed with AD or ADHD. Um, it has to be mild fever. Oral temperature between 99.5 and 100.5 or chills. Uh, sore throat, another common issue that's there. Um, and of course, that would, that's what really causes a lot of people to think that it's directly related to the Epstein-Barr type of virus or a similar type of virus. <clears throat> uh, painful <clears throat> lymph nodes <clears throat> in the anterior or 
or posterior cervical or axillary um, distribution, or unexplained generalized muscle weaknesses, or muscle discomfort or uh, myalgia, generalized fatigue for at least 24 hours after previously to tolerated uh, exercise, generalized headaches unlike any previous pain, um, uh, migratory anthralgia algia, uh, without um, joint swelling or redness, um, neuropsychologic complaints, one or more of the following, uh, photophobia, uh, transient visual scotoma, um, forgetfulness, excessive irritability, confusion, difficult thinking, inability to concentrate, depression. Wow, that describes most seminarians. <laughs> right, and the NTI exam. That's right. Uh, sleep disturbance is another thing. And, um, and description of the main symptom complex within hours or days. Um, now, you need about eight of those, uh, of those 11, to really be definitively diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome. What's the physical criteria then? It must be documented by a physician on at least two occasions, at least one month apart. Uh, Low-grade fever, as we saw earlier in that criteria. Non-exudative um, uh, fardingness, which basically has to do, as you can see, um, with viruses or sometimes bacteria from a cold, flu, or sinus infection that involves the throat or uh, palatable or tender anterior or posterior cervical or auxiliary lymph nodes. So that would be some of the physical criteria that actually a doctor would look toward in order to try to lay some kind of diagnosis of um, chronic fatigue syndrome on a person. What about the approach then at this point? Uh, through physical examination, um, if organic condition is found, then a person will need help in how to respond to the illness in a biblical manner. If that's true, if they're able to identify, hey, this person has 8, 9, 10, or 11 of these characteristics, and they diagnose them as having this, then as a counselor, we will need to help them to respond to this illness, much the same way that a person has been diagnosed with cancer then how are you going to help them and give them the hope that God would give them? Um, obviously, we go back to 1 Corinthians 10, 13, right? There's no temptation taken you except for what is common to man, and God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted above what you're able, but with that temptation, he will always provide a way of escape, a way to stand up under it. Or if not found, the counselor needs to take a detailed look at problems, pressures, and unpleasant circumstances in the person's life. So there's one of two directions we're going to go here. Either there is a description of this as having been found, and the medical doctor would look at this as a definitive disease diagnosis, or it's not found, they're not able to find anything, then, um, then we have to look at what is it that's going on in this person's life? What are the problems that they're facing or the pressures that they're struggling under or the unpleasant circumstances or maybe there's been some kind of loss or significant setback that they know that they're never going to regain or achieve, which carries this whole idea of hopelessness, probably carries a good deal of depression that's going to go along with it as well. Well, we have to do a lot of data gathering. There's no substitute for this. Like Proverbs 18.13 says, if a man speaks before he listens, he is a fool. And again, we come back to this issue here. Um, what are the pleasant and unpleasant circumstances that are going on in their life? Um, sometimes it's related to marriage. Sometimes it's related to singleness. Sometimes it's related to uh, just um, repeated reoccurrence of other physical diseases. And even though their body has conquered that, they've received the correct type of medical treatment, they seem to come down with this unexplainable, undiagnosable issue of chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, what's good or, 
or bad about them. We need to ask the council they, uh, about their circumstances. We need to then evaluate their responses. What do they think about their responses? Um, and, um, and, and teach them how to respond to them in a godly way. Do they see them through God's eyes? Or are they resentful? Do they see these circumstances that they're faith, facing as part of the sovereign unfolding of God's plans? And this is where verses like Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 14 comes in. When times are good, be happy. When times are bad, Solomon says there, or when times are adverse, remember God has created one as well as the other. All right? So we've got to decide, then what does God intend us to understand about this? Um, this problem, this physical drain that I have. Um, how much time do they spend thinking about them and dwelling upon their particular problem? That's a critical issue as well. So what about pleasant or unpleasant circumstances? Let me add to this. One of the key things, I think, with CFS is, is whether or not the person is getting moderate regular exercise. All right? This is really key. To build themselves up strength-wise. We're not talking about putting them into a heavy exercise routine. We're not talking about that. Don't do that. They won't be able to do it. They won't have the energy to do it. But mild exercise that gradually increases and begins to build some of their body strength. Um, for some people, that's going to be harder than other people. Some people are allergic to exercise, all right? And uh, boy, it's hard to get them to just go out and walk. I want you to walk, go out and walk around your neighborhood for 10 minutes today. That's all I want, just 10 minutes. Walk around the neighborhood. Oh, that's hard to do. Then you increase it to 15 minutes, then 20 minutes, then 30 minutes around the neighborhood. At least that's 30 minutes more than they were doing before. Uh, mild exercise, which kind of gets all the right things pumping in the body. Um, look for factors that may contribute to the fatigue. Fatigue can be aggravated by responses to life. Um, they, they're not responding to life in a real good way. And so as a result of that, their tendency is to just bow out. I mean, we see this. Take your Bible just for a moment and go over to um, Proverbs chapter 26. Um, you get the idea that um, the lazy man or the sluggard of Proverbs oftentimes has the same kind of characteristics. Boy, you're going to get people mad if you directly launch into this, but has the same kind of characteristics of the chronic fatigue syndrome person. Um, that doesn't mean that everybody with CFS is a sluggard. I don't want to say that. Because some people really want to work on their problems. So you've got to be very, very careful when you, when you come to this. But when you get to Proverbs 26, verse 12, he says, Do you see a man that's wise in his own eyes? There's more hope for a fool than for him. The sluggard says there's a lion in the road, a lion in the open square. As the door turns on its hinges, so does the sluggard on his bed. The sluggard buries his hand in the dish. He's weary of bringing it back to his mouth again. The sluggard is wiser in his own eyes than seven men who can give a discreet answer. What's implied there is that seven men have just walked into his house to persuade him, hey, we were just outside. There's no lion in the road. Everything's okay. Get up. Well, he's so lazy. On the one hand, he's got an arrogance and pride to him. He won't listen to the counsel of seven men who answer discreetly. There's no lion in the road, they say. He won't listen to that. On the other hand, he's so lazy, he doesn't even, he doesn't even have, and I know that this is kind of an ancient analogy, have enough energy to lift the, the food to his mouth and to feed himself. Um, sometimes a, a person that's suffering from chronic fatigue syndrome is like that. Now please, again, don't go away saying that what we're talking about here is that a person with chronic fatigue syndrome is always a sluggard. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that there are characteristics of a sluggard that are similar. And there are some who think they have chronic fatigue syndrome when in reality they don't. They're lazy. They are sluggards. And, and as a result, there has been a, just a general 
running down of their body. And when their body gets run down, then they don't feel good. And they're susceptible to more colds and more viruses and more disease um, than the average person. And um, um, so it has a physical effect on them. Um, furthermore, there's frequent thoughts of unpleasantness of fatigue. And they start to... Um, the thoughts of that drive them into depression. Um, they become very, very depressed. For example, uh, the unfairness of what is happening. Why, why does it have to happen to me? Now that's something that we can address from a biblical perspective. Because really from a biblical perspective, God is, um, is a just God. And we need to zero in on the fact that he's a just God. God has never made any mistakes and he didn't begin with this person with CFS. He didn't begin with you. You're not God's first mistake. He somehow is not unjust here. Um, or you find them wishing for something better. Oh, I wish I had a better body. I wish I had better circumstances. I wish I had better whatever. Fear and worry is also a very common theme that seems to take place here. Fear of personal health and how their personal health is going to go. A worry of not getting work done because of the fatigue. They start a project and get going and they don't have enough energy to finish it. A uh, worry of, of getting over the fatigue. You know, is this ever going to come to an end? Am I ever going to come to the point where I don't have to suffer from this anymore? Or there's fear of possible accusations because of the fatigue. Um... They fear that somebody's going to come along and accuse them of possibly being lazy or being a sluggard. This is something that they, they worry about. They are fearful of. Or there's lack of proper sleep. What are the thoughts when lying in bed? A person with chronic fatigue often rests a lot during the day. And as a result of that, the, what we talked about in terms of the stages of sleep at night, they're not getting all the stages of sleep. So that, again, has a cumulative effect upon their body. That wears on the immune system and represses the immune system. So um, all of those things. Attitude is another issue. They may have been accused of faking the symptoms. Right? And um, most people that come to you that are professing Christians are not going to do that. They're not going to fake it. Um, they're really describing what they feel, right? Um, they're more concerned with the praises of men than the praises of God. And that's the reason why their attitude is so negative, right? Because they're, they're obviously not going to receive much praises from men. From a man's standpoint, they look lazy. They look uh, non-responsive to life. They look unhappy. They oftentimes look depressed. Uh, they shuffle around. Um, there's no spring in their step. Um, or maybe guilt um, is a critical issue here. Um, and, and, of course, there is no such thing as false guilt. We've talked about that in previous counseling classes. But no such thing as false guilt. False guilt doesn't exist. Guilt is a fact that has to do with culpability before God. Um, if they are aware of unconfessed and unrepented of guilt that's a part of their past, this will have a drain on their conscience and their attitude as well. Unconfessed sin does that. Uh, David talks about that. When he didn't confess his sin, um, his bones, as it were, wasted away within him. Um, or G here, is the person taking advantage of the fatigue for some reason? Are they taking advantage of this by overreacting to everything? Or they're attempting to manipulate other people. Well, I can't do this. I can't do that. I can't fulfill this responsibility. I can't fulfill that responsibility. You're going to have to do this for me. You're going to have to do that for me. And they use their chronic fatigue syndrome as a way to manipulate other people. These are things that you've got to be aware of in counseling. And becomes really a source of frustration and strife within families. So are they using it for this particular purpose? Um, what are some of the possible causes here? Well, 
The fatigue may be the result of one's responses to the problems of life, not a result of a virus. In, until later on, medical science is able to dem demonstrate that definitively. Uh, quote unquote psycho uh, psychosomatic. Uh, peop uh, people, because of their unbiblical responses to the problems in life, create symptoms. Uh, in fact, psychosomatic is kind of an old term now. It's uh, uh, psychoneuroimmunology now instead of psycho psychosomatic. Psychoneuroimmunology is the is the new term for this, but it means the same thing. That when people think that they're sick, then they start to manifest symptoms of that sickness. All right? Um, and then it creates the symptoms. Then secondly, uh, not organic, but a habit. Um, in, in other words, um, this is a way that probably has a preconditioning element to it, goes way back in their life, Maybe from the time that they were a child, they learned to respond to life in this way. And it's a withdrawal issue. They learned that they received a lot of sympathy and a lot of support, a lot of kudos from people when they act helpless or they acted weak or they acted fatigued. They realized that that was the case. And so as a result, they fall into a life pattern that's that way. Um, or it's organic. I mean, obviously, as biblical counselors, we're not going to rule out the fact that there may be a, a, um, a component of this that is really organic that hasn't been discovered yet. Is this organic? And maybe it's just not known yet. Well, that's possible, but that doesn't change it a whole lot in relationship to our counsel to people. Because if it is an organic problem, then as I said before, you're going to treat it like you do every other disease. And by the way, uh, there's excellent, excellent, the first chapter, first chapter or so of um, Dr. Bob Smith's book here, The Christian Counselor's Medical Desk Reference, uh, he talks about a Christian's response to illness and disease. And that's, that's just very excellent a biblical development of how to respond to that kind of thing. In this particular case, if it is organic, then you can teach them, hey, listen, we live in a sin-cursed world. Disease is a result of that sin-cursed world. And we're all infected with some kind of disease, one way or the other. And the key is, not so much whether or not I have a disease, the key is my response to it from God's perspective. How am I handling that? Which brings us to the issue of unbiblical responses. So, oftentimes you are able to identify um, people with CFS. They have unbiblical responses. Uh, this energy has been used in a non-constructive manner without benefit of relaxation from the fatigue. Um, some of the examples of this, worry, which is a concern over the future. Uh, the wrong day, can't act upon the future. Rather than releasing bodily energy through productive activity, it actually activates more energy that is not used. So worry hypes the body up and uses up productive energy in unproductive ways. And so that person is in this pattern that repeats itself of, of getting worry, then fatigue. No energy. Worry, fatigue. Worry, fatigue. Worry, fatigue. And it drains energy in an unnecessary way. Or there's focusing on unsolved problems and the discomfort from them also wastes the energy and hinders the restful sleep. Anytime a person focuses on unsolved problems then they're not thinking in a God-honoring way. They're not focusing on God's promises. They're not focusing on God's um, um, ability and, and um, um, to be able to overcome their problems. Um, and so as a result of that, all of that focused concentration and the discomfort from those particular problems ends up draining energy in an unnecessary way and thereby hinders restful sleep at night. So we toss and turn like we saw there in Proverbs chapter 23 of the man who tosses and turns on his bed. Or there's overwhelming desire to be rid of fatigue can also be a contributing factor. In other words, the main focus of their life is to get rid of the fatigue. So they run all over the place they seek 
nutritional ways to get rid of the fatigue. They seek medical cures, obscure ones, maybe in foreign countries to get rid of the fatigue. They're running all over the place in order to find, as if the whole goal of their life is to get rid of the fatigue. No, that's not the whole goal of their life. The goal of their life is to honor Christ and to serve Him. If they can find an answer to the fatigue, that's fine. If they can't, then they have to trust the sovereignty of God in their life. They don't allow their life to be consumed. Um, this becomes a dominant theme of their life, running around trying to find the cure. It increases the discomfort, ultimately, of the feeling. And in reality, it's something like this that it becomes the idol. I gotta find the cure at all cost. Even if I have to spend my last penny, I've got to feel better. And as a result, they waste time with their friends, they waste time with their family, they waste time with their church. Um, time that they could have used very productively to honor and glorify the Lord. It's all zeroed in on trying to get rid of the fatigue. So this can be a very destructive path that they choose to go after in their life. What's the counsel that we need to give a person like this who experiences chronic fatigue? I love that picture. All right, there's a good picture of a person with chronic fatigue syndrome. What's the counsel? Well, uh, see a medical doctor. It's one of the first things. Um, not just any doctor, but a good medical doctor. CFS symptoms are mimicked by other diseases. So we've got to make sure that it's not some other kind of disease that's going on. That's really critical. So the first thing you've got to do is see a doctor. Spend a lot of time gathering data about their life, their attitudes, their thoughts, their actions and reactions to unpleasant situations, stresses, worries. This is really key. Um, helping them keep a journal of um, their thought. A thought journal can be very productive and will also help you to identify whether or not this person is still struggling with depression. Don't minimize the problem by calling the fatigue imaginary. I don't even get into that with counselees. I don't even, I don't even debate whether or not it's imaginary or real. I just assume that they're coming with the problem that it is a problem for them. Whether it is imaginary or real, God will identify in the long run if we deal with this biblically. Okay? So I don't even debate that issue. That's a non-issue. And somebody wants to debate it with you and they, have, they claim they have CFS, I say, listen, I don't know. I'm not God. God's the only one who has the answer to this. But I do have a very clear direction from his word on how we need to go about handling this or looking at it. Um... It is a real symptom. All right? It is a real symptom. We're not calling it necessarily a real disease, but it is a real symptom in this particular case. What are the reasons for the illness? Well, as we alluded to just a minute ago, the curse of sin is part of the reason. Um, sin engendered as well. Um, there are some things that we do that bring on, we handle our life, we don't treat our uh, bodies well and that brings on certain diseases as well. That's sin and gender diseases like James 5, 15 and 16 talks about. Um, or maybe as the Apostle Paul acknowledged, maybe it's the type of thing that is to prevent sin in that person's life. Paul had a weakness, a thorn in the flesh whether that was a person or a disease we can go back and forth and debate on that. There's different theories that run around there. What is that thorn in the flesh? Paul had a thorn in the flesh and he said that God had given it to him because of his, the surpassing greatness of his revelations to keep him from becoming too proud. So is there a possibility that this chronic fatigue syndrome is actually a tool of God to enable this person to be more holy? Is that a possibility? And this is something that they're going to actually struggle with for the rest of their life. But it is to be looked at as a very positive thing, not negative, that it's God's tool of sanctification in their life. And can they view it almost the way 
the man who was born blind in John 9, can they view it as something ultimately that brings glory to God? So as a result of this, it results in a healing. Um, or his healing resulted in, the, in bringing glory to God. Can this, whether that person is healed or not, bring glory to God? Um, even if they're not healed, is that a possibility? Well, if there is no organic cause, then look for unbiblical responses to life. And especially what you're dealing with here is patterns. You're looking for patterns, attitudinal, and actions and reactions to unbiblical things of life. Where are those patterns? How have they formed in their thinking and behavior? Help your counselee see that it is idolatry when getting rid of the fatigue is more important than pleasing God and being responsible in spite of the fatigue. And that's when, it be, that's when then getting rid of it becomes the reigning, ruling motive of the heart that drives and controls them. Remember, the symptoms, again, are real. Even if there is no way to identify that it is an organic cause, remember, the symptoms are real. You may need to help in scheduling, discipline, taking thoughts captive. You can't expect as much from a chronic fatigue person in terms of actual mental or physical exertion, but you got to expect something. And so you may have to schedule, even though compared to the normal person, it's not a very rigid schedule. You may have to talk about discipline issues, but compared to the normal person, it's not as rigid. Or taking thoughts captive, their ability to concentrate is not as great. But you're still aiming at a goal. You're helping them reign in their life and control what they can control to God's honor and glory. Focus on how one can glorify God and increase effectiveness of ministry. How can that happen? Um, all right, so you have chronic fatigue syndrome. How can you glorify God and increase your fit effectiveness? as a result of this. That's the real critical issue. If it is organic, then pleasing God is possible even if the fatigue does not leave. Even if it becomes a persistent thing that goes on indefinitely, then we can learn to please God. It's the person who produces fruit in the midst of those stresses that's key. Change the focus to pleasing God rather than getting rid of the fatigue again. That's a major theme here. The problem now is their response to it. It's not getting rid of this fatigue. It's how they're going to respond to it. How they're going to allow it to shape and deform their thoughts, their activities, their decisions in life. How, how is it going to do that? Uh, how can this be used to glorify God again? Comes, we come back to that question. All right, if it is an organic thing and they're suffering from it, then how can God take this disease and bring glory to himself in my life? We can see this in John 9, 3 with a man born blind again. In 2 Corinthians 12, uh, 9 and 10 with the Apostle Paul again where um, his strength is made perfect in my weakness. Um, so the grace of God is exalted there. Or James 1, 2 through 4. We're supposed to consider it joy when we face all kinds of trials and different temptations. How can we um, be joyful in the midst of that? And then ultimately, here's the key thing. And this is the key on whether or not this person is really interested in working on this God's way. Are they able to thank God for it? When they get to the point, when your counseling gets to the point where they say, you know, I am thankful to God for what has happened to me. When that happens then you know that their thinking has changed. You know it's headed down the right direction. Um, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 20 says, Always giving thanks for all things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. So, in all things, that includes even chronic fatigue uh, syndrome and facing chronic fatigue syndrome. 
F then um, see the problem as something used by God to develop the character of Christ in the individual's life. See the problem as being used by God to develop the character. Romans 8, 28 and 29. All things work together for good to them that are called. Um, Matthew 20, 28. Look for the ways to be serving. All right. Um, Matthew 20, 28. The Lord, that's what the Lord, the Lord came not to serve, or, or not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So, <clears throat> um, the Son of Man did not come to be served, verse 28 says, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So how can they do that? Um, was Jesus ever exhausted? Yes. Was he ever tired? Yes. Did he ever spend sleepless nights? Yes. You can see him all night long praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, so they're not the only ones to have gone through this. And um, we have a sympathetic high priest uh, because of it. Then control and use thoughts and minds productively. 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 10, 5, bringing all of our thoughts captive. Use our mind for praying, reading, and other profitable things. Um, lying awake at night. Meditate on scripture rather than thinking about unpleasantness. Replace habit of focusing on symptoms to focusing on whatever things are true, honest, just, worthy of good report. Anything that's play, praiseworthy, think on these things. The primary goal, again, should be pleasing God. 2 Corinthians 5, 9, Paul says, I make it my goal to please him. Don't try to manipulate God or use God as a magic genie in order to get rid of your problems. Don't use that. But in all of this, it's vitally important then that we learn to focus on life. On life. Now, here's some closing passages I want to point your attention to as we bring this to a close. But Psalm 118 and verse 24. Psalm 118, 24. Where it says, This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. In 2 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And verse 8. 2 Corinthians 9, 8. Where he says, And God is able to make all grace abound to you, that everything, having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. Then there's 2 Corinthians 12, 8 through 10. Verse 8 says, uh, Concerning this, I entreat the Lord three times that it may depart from me. And he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weakness that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weakness, with insults, with dis dis distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Strong, that is, in the Lord. He's not taking, talking about physical strength, but strong in the Lord. And, of course, Philippians 4.13 where it talks about, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength, which basically is really focused on discontentment. So this can grow out of a spirit of discontentment in life. He's learned to be content in all things. Realize that the only real victory is going to come through dealing with the problem from a biblical and eternal perspective. That's key. 2 Corinthians 4, verses 16, 14 through 18. Um, again, um, verse 16 says, Therefore we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day, for momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So Peter had joy in the midst of of difficulty, you can see that um, in um, First Peter, uh, all of First Peter as well as Second Peter, and in the most, the most, in the midst of most severe persecution and difficulty, there was still an overriding joy. 
So, that helps us to understand not just insomnia, but chronic fatigue syndrome and how we have to be sensitive and address those particular issues with uh, people that will be seeking us out for pastoral counsel.